Hey everybody, it's Sam with Wrestling Overtime with your Raves and Rants review of WWE Raw on March 23rd of 2020, and we're getting ready for WrestleMania. It is about a week, week and a half away, and Paul Heyman opens up the show. I enjoyed him opening it up and just listing everyone that Brock has ever beaten, from Taker to Cena to Reigns to everyone. And then Drew starts his promo off with kind of the same uh, language as Paul and how, uh, how he goes on about throwing Brock out of the ring at the Royal Rumble and then claymoring him again and again uh, in Brooklyn and how he is going to be the champion come WrestleMania. Well, after that promo, we find ourselves in the ring with Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar. Now, I will go ahead and give props to WWE. They changed the hard camera angle so that it is straight on, looking at the ring, looking at the stage, more like AEW. And that definitely seems to work a lot better. You're not seeing a lot of different empty seats and everything. And this basically is a typical Paul Heyman, you know, promo. And it feels familiar with him using the same tone, same language, um, everything, and then with Brock just standing there. Because when you think about it, which I hadn't until this point, the fans, the audience, the WWE Universe doesn't really say anything to Brock. They don't really say anything to Paul Heyman. It is rare you get a what chant or you get um, a CM Punk chant or any kind of chant going at Paul Heyman or Brock Lesnar. And I think that people could look at that as, well, you know, the audience isn't really active and involved. No, I actually take it the exact opposite way. Paul Heyman is someone that you actually want to hear. You actually know that he is um, possibly going to give you a hint, probably give you um, some kind of thing that they're either going to play on later in the show or is going to be part of the storyline. And so, Heyman says that he is giving us certainty with Brock, and that is what the WWE Universe has come to expect out of Brock Les. Um, I loved Paul Heyman's line that God's prayer line is busy right now, but Brock will answer Drew's prayers of making it quick and painless. However, after Brooklyn, Brock has decided not to make it painless. So, um, that kind of appears to me, and maybe I'm reading way, way, way more into this than, than I should. I just feel like with Paul Heyman not giving us a spoiler, not a prediction, that they are looking at Drew for the championship. Maybe Brock has decided to actually give up the belt to Drew McIntyre. Um, I have a funny feeling that Vince McMahon probably... Had, to, had it filmed both ways if he was there so that he could decide at the last minute. Or maybe he's making his decision now as we speak. But um, I can't help but think that everyone 
on the WWE creative, everyone on WWE production, is wanting only to film Drew winning. I feel like Paul Heyman being over Raw feels like it's Drew's time. However, I... I can't help but in the back of my mind think about how Vince changes things. And if he was in Orlando this week, how, as they're taping it, he doesn't want to tape just an alternative ending just in case. I hope that this is Saturday night's main event. I really do. I I think that WWE is going to get more eyes on Saturday night than they get on Sunday night. I think they're going to have to make a big splash on Saturday night. And so I really think that Brock and Drew needs to be the moment. And I think they need to go with Randy and Edge on Sunday night and hope that long-time viewers will tune in to relive Rainy and Edge because that storyline has been unbelievable. Um, I, uh, I know that I'm giving you guys a little bit of dead air as I'm thinking and hoping that Vince does not change his mind and that he, he does let Drew Uh, take the belt away from Brock so that we can have a full-time champion. I just don't know, guys. I I just don't know. Uh, Anyway, after that, we get a flashback of The Undertaker last week basically destroying Susan Anderson uh, because they chose to deliver the contract out. I'm not sure why we got that flashback right before they showed the replay of the 2015 triple threat match from Royal Rumble. Because The Undertaker's not in it. It made sense to show that immediately after the Brock segment. So, WWE just really didn't put it together right then. I... Looking back and watching that 2015 match makes me wish for that. I was complaining in 2015, though, about WWE Creative. Not knowing that five years later, I would be looking back on that match and missing... Seth's blonde streak in his hair and and John Cena's crew cut and how they worked that match and how each of them kind of choreographed to get their movesets in without laying around a lot. I hate that this was shown on Raw though. Um, I've seen this match, obviously, before. I didn't need to see it on Raw. It took up a good 40 or 45 minutes with commercials and stuff. Um, I really wish they would have gave me something. And then, after the match, they again show a flashback from two weeks ago when AJ Styles started calling out the Undertaker and getting really personal about Michelle McCool and then again uh, last week which makes me think that they really did screw up showing that flashback before that match and so WWE for them always being live is really dropping the ball producing more of a studio show and, or having vignettes or promos or matches from five years ago to throw in. They are totally off their game. And I don't know if it, maybe they told their crew that usually travels with them to go away and go home and they have maybe the NXT crew doing the Raw or... I don't know what their issue is about going from 
you know, live promos to tape promos to flashbacks to live matches to, to you know, a match from five years ago. I, I don't know what the problem is. Um, but anyway, my thoughts on the whole flashbacks thing and then, you know, them getting ready to have AJ come out is, are we supposed to think that AJ Styles has now crossed the line because he's mentioned the Undertaker's wife? That he's crossed the line thinking that or saying that the Undertaker's wife runs him. That we're supposed to think that the Undertaker has gone soft. That we're supposed to think that AJ Styles has crossed the line by calling him by his real name instead or instead of, you know, calling him the dead man or calling him Taker or calling him Undertaker or whatever. Um Is the W W E setting us up for a swerve. Is there going to be a surprise? I mean, because that is what I've been thinking from the get go. You know, AJ is finally back to his normal self being cocky, being arrogant, being, you know, poking at people, talking about how good he is. He hasn't been that way for about a year. Basically, since getting back with um, Gallows and Anderson. But now he is. He's younger. Um, he is obviously more athletic right now than The Undertaker. So are we going to be expecting a swerve? Should we be expecting a swerve? Is the swerve going to be that there is no swerve? I don't know. Uh, we see Andrew, uh, AJ come out with Anderson and Gallows, and they don't come to the ring. They stand basically on the stage. This looks borderline awkward. Because AJ's not really talking to the audience. He's, I don't know. I guess he's talking to Undertaker, but Undertaker's not there, yet he's talking to us here at home, and so it just feels weird. It feels crazy. Um, having Gallows and Anderson there makes it feel worse. Almost wish they would have done this as AJ coming out and talking to to Byron Saxon and Tom Phillips or something. Uh, just really weird. Um, not the best promo that I've seen AJ do. Um, he talks about how he doesn't know whether the match is Saturday or Sunday, and he doesn't really care, but he guesses that maybe, you know, Taker cares, because when will Michelle decide which night to let him out of the house? Um, then he brings up Taker being there last week to sign the contract, and talks about how Undertaker had maternity pants on. Well, you know what? I was wondering that myself, so I'm glad AJ brought it up. Um, I don't know what that was that Taker had underneath his normal pants. Uh, it almost looked like Spanx to me, and I was thinking, is his gut that huge that he needs to keep it in with Spanx? But then AJ said it was maternity pants, and I was thinking, well, it did kind of look like maternity pants. So, what in the world? So, AJ starts spitting some truth bombs about how his mystique is gone, and how he doesn't want Mark Calloway. He wants the real Undertaker. Well, you know what, AJ? I agree. If The Undertaker is actually going to come out, and he's actually going to wrestle, and he's actually going to do something, then he needs to be able to do it. And if he's not able, then 
he needs to do some magical things, or he needs to bury people, or surprise people, or something like that. Uh, because his mystique is gone. And AJ's exactly right. Him getting a Twitter, him getting Instagram, him uh, going on podcasts, um, yeah, it is making him lose a lot of his mystique. And so AJ says that he's going to bring the dead man back. He's going to bring him back for the WWE Universe that he wants to take him on. And so he challenges him to a boneyard match. Now, I don't know about you guys. I have no clue what a boneyard match is. Is this something that AJ come up with or something WWE Creative come up with? What on earth is that? I know Taker doesn't know what it is. I hope they do something cool. I hope they have been planning this and laying this out and that it is something spectacular to see. But knowing WWE Creative, um, it won't be. They'll probably have the ring littered with a bunch of bones that they stole from some museum. Personally, I kind of hope it is in a graveyard. I hope it's outside, it's in a graveyard, there are tombstones, um, and they are actually having a dirty, nighttime, nasty match. But what, what, what is it? I, I don't know. I liked AJ's ending comment, that he was going to bury Taker, just like Michelle McCool had already buried his career. I I enjoy this personal cocky AJ. I wish he never would have left. That got me on AJ's side. That is what you know intrigued me about AJ Styles when he first came to the WWE. And so by doing this promo, even though this wasn't a great promo, Throwing out the boneyard and throwing out some personal comments, he does have me interested in what have they come up with. They've gotten a chance to tape this. They've gotten a chance to do this and make edits and get it exactly right, get the shots exactly right, to put it together. What exactly can WWE come up with? I'm I'm interested in it. Well, then they do an announcement that Street Profits are going to take on basically Zelina Vega's team of Andrade and Angel Garza for the Raw Tag Team Championships at WrestleMania. Why? What's the story? Why are they fighting? What is going on? Why does part of me think that they wrote down the WrestleMania card and said, Oh no! We don't have the Raw Tag Team Champions there. We gotta put them on there. Who are they gonna face? What are we gonna do? And they just threw something out and Andrade is dating Charlotte Flair and they said, hey, we'll throw them in there. I mean, we all realize that the Street Profits, number one, just got the belts and didn't really have a storyline to get the belts. It was almost like they just wanted them off Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy as fast as they could and they gave them to whoever walked in or walked by next. And it just happened to be the Street Profits. Are they really going to have Garza and Andrade go from fighting the Latino war with the United States Championship belt with Humberto and Rey Mysterio to fighting the Street Profits? 
Now, I am sure that this has something to do with they have been taking on Rey Mysterio and there was supposed to probably be a big match and now he has the coronavirus and is quarantined. So he can't take one and ride it. And they decided that Garza was getting over so we've got to put him in a match and let's put him up with the Street Profits. So I'm asking, where's the story? So what do they do? They try to create a story. So that's what basically the next half an hour of Raw is, is, oh my gosh, we've created this match. We have a week and a half. We have basically two shows to build this. And we've got to figure out some way to build this. So... They have Charlie interview Zelina Vega, who goes on about how she has the most talented, athletic, charismatic team in the whole WWE. And I wanted to hear her do a promo. Vega, here's your chance to shine. Let's cut one. Let's cut a promo. Let's make me get into this. Let's make me believe this. No. That's that's basically her promo. Because then they let Andrade speak. Because he's learning English. Because Vince has said, you know, if you want to do anything in this company, you have to learn English. I don't care if you marry Charlotte. You still have to know English. So he's got to speak. And so he says, the Street Profits want the smoke. Well, he wants the belts. Okay, what? What are you talking about? And why did you do a smoke motion? Like you're smoking a cigarette. Um, makes no sense. Then we have Garza all of a sudden flirting with Charlie and saying they are men who always get what they want and winks. And Charlie acts like some schoolgirl that we've never seen her act this way. And get some bears. Am I the only one who thinks um, the men who always get what they want line in this era of Me Too and women's evolution and all of that probably shouldn't have been said? That's ridiculous. Because he wanted to do a double in Tronde there where... Yes, we want the belts, but he was looking at Charlie saying, basically, I want you too. And we are men that always get what we want. And I know a lot of you are listening to this going, oh my gosh, she's going on a feminist tear. She's reading too much into this. Yeah, I probably am. Because when you're WWE and you're a global company... And something as big as the Me Too movement has taken place. You really have to change the way you look at things if you want to keep your audience and grow your audience. And one way that they can grow their audience is by getting women involved. By getting women to watch. And I don't know that they necessarily do that. And that they see that being a untapped potential of who will not only watch their, their TV shows, but will follow their storylines. Who will then talk about it in social media, who will then drag their boyfriends and husbands and sons and daughters to the live events, who will then spend money. I don't think they get that. But anyway, we next get a 
um, Andrade Garza match versus Ricochet and uh, Cedric Alexander. First of all, I have to say, I absolutely love Ricochet's new clean-cut look. I mean, it looks like he literally has uh, just shaved the top of his head and has shined it all up. And he's cut down the goatee and everything, and I just absolutely love it. And then I have to ask... Who in the world did Ricochet piss off to fall this far this fast? He's teaming with Cedric Alexander, whose wife, Big Swole, is, in AEW is over more than he is, and probably is on TV more than he is, and I think she's been on AEW maybe three times. Um... Ricochet, what on earth did you do? Who did you piss off? What did you say? Do you need to buy them cookies? Because for Ricochet to be involved in this match is absolutely awful. For us not to be talking about Ricochet going into WrestleMania is absolutely awful. He should be taking on Andrade for the United States Championship. Not being a partner to a jobber when they're trying to sell a completely different angle. Now, I will say that when Ricochet, you know, does his thing in the ring and Garza and Andrade try to jump him before Alexander even comes out and he fights them off, I actually like that. I I thought that was, you know, not bad. Um, I thought this, this was starting out to be a pretty good match with the commentary. I thought Byron and... Tom are actually talking about the match. They're actually talking about the moves. They're actually putting over Vega and her team. Um, they're actually selling this match. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, these commentators have gotten really, really a lot better when it's a two-man crew instead of a three-man crew. And the athleticism of the match in the beginning was really good, especially with Ricochet and Garza. I mean, they they were showing off. And then we see the Street Profits come out, and they... A join, you know, join the announcers table, and while they're good talkers, I kind of wanted to hear the commentary, and that's one of the few times that, you know, I, I've said that. I really wanted to watch Ricochet and Garza a little longer. Now, I didn't didn't want to see Cedric Alexander. And I don't know what happened at the end of this match. I rewound it on my DVR. I looked at what people said on Twitter and on different places on the internet. My first reaction is this was a botched finish. Um, first of all, Andrade, I think, totally missed a kick and it by the angle it was shot at it was pretty obvious was he supposed to miss it because Cedric Alexander has this blinding speed and got out of the way I don't know but I do know that it was it looked in slow-mo that it was botched because you see Andrade miss the kick and he decides to plant his foot and do a spinning elbow. 
and you can see on Cedric Alexander's face that, oh my gosh, what's going on here? And as Andrade hits him, he hits him so hard that he knocks the spit out of Cedric Alexander's mouth. In slow-mo, you can see spit flying everywhere. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, and I'm not sure that, um, they didn't, he didn't knock, um, Cedric Alexander out, or at least ring his bell. Because I noticed right after that, um, you know, they do the promo with the Street Profits. And the way they shoot that is so that they don't show the ring. So I'm wondering if Alexander got his bell rung or was knocked out and they kind of had to slide him and help him out of the ring. But I'm left with this match and I'm thinking, why does Garza need to take his pants off all the time? And why do we care about the Street Profits? Like I said, there was no buildup to them getting the belts. And then last week, it was just seven days ago, we saw them at the Stone Cold Steve Austin uh, 316 Celebration Bash getting Stone Cold stunned every way but loose, getting absolutely killed by Becky, beer poured over them by the gallon. But I'm supposed to be concerned when they go down to the ring to confront Andrade and Garza? Becky whooped them. Steve Austin has injuries and is older. Whoop them. But I think that they're going to go down there and take it to Andrade and Garza? No. I don't believe that for one minute. And so seeing them kind of screw around in the ring and Garza and Andrade basically run away and what was up with Andrade picking up the tag team belt and showing it to him and saying this is mine and then laying it down that's ridiculous he obviously has no clue get him off my screen and why are we having this match um this match better be 10 minutes tops on Wrestlemania I know it was an afterthought. It's obvious it was an afterthought. It better be 10 minutes. Because then they go away and we get the Street Profits taken on Shane Thorne and Brendan Vink from NXT. Well, guess what? I've never heard of them. They say that they've been on some takeovers. Now, granted, I have not watched NXT from the beginning, and I have not watched every takeover, but I have not heard of these two guys, and this match is worthless. How are they getting so much offense on the tag team champs? This should have been... Some kind of one, two, three, four, five, uh, tag team, uh, dock and slam somebody and four frog splashes and it's over. It should have taken 30 seconds of my time. But no, they actually had a match and I'm thinking, so the Street Profits got beat up by Stone Cold and Becky last week and these two jobbers from NXT are getting offense on them. Really? You want me to watch a match with them and Andrade and Garza for WrestleMania? Are you serious? It It's ridiculous. It's absolutely just ridiculous. Did love 
that they showed a video of Riddick Moss out jogging. Now, we've got a global pandemic going on. And granted, there was no one really near him. But he's out jogging with the 24-7 belt. And a referee in a car pulls up. And he immediately tells him to get out. No, no, no. You want the referee to stay in. Because when the referee actually gets out, that means someone's coming. At least Riddick didn't act like an idiot and not know there was someone coming. He did look around to see if someone was coming. He just didn't look behind him as Archery slid out of the trunk and pinned him. And then, you know, basically drove away for, you know, the um, the the win. And I'm glad to see R-Truth back with the 24-7 title. And I hope that that is a running storyline throughout WrestleMania. I hope R-Truth is doing skits all through WrestleMania. In between matches, heck, it can be during the Street Profits and Andrade and Garza's match, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, have him run right through that tag team match and have people chasing him and him having to fight him off and then go about his business. That needs to be one of the storylines is our truth because he is, you know, someone that I definitely want to see. Then we start the 10 o'clock hour. And if you guys have been following in on, along with my episodes, you know, that is something that WWE said in the beginning of January that they want to really make a splash in the 10 o'clock hour. They don't want TVs turning off. They don't want their ratings going down at the 10 o'clock hour. So they started off, you know, in January, of course, with Lashley and Lana and Rusev and Liv Morgan, and they continued that storyline. So, I've been watching, what are they starting the 10 o'clock hour with? And they start this 10 o'clock hour off with Charlie sitting in a darkened ring with Shayna Baszler. And the first thing I notice is Shayna's pure size compared to Charlie. She looks like an absolute monster next to Charlie. And I know that Charlie is itty bitty. But I mean, Shayna looks like she could eat Charlie. I noticed that she has makeup on. And the way her makeup is done, it makes her look like a badass. I notice that when they show her name, she still has an XT by her name on her nameplate. And then I notice the Iron Mike Tyson shirt that she is wearing, the t-shirt under her jacket. And I was like, this all adds to Shayna's cool factor. And I love it. I absolutely love it. I love how Charlie is asking her questions and talking, and and Shayna's not responding. And finally, Baszler says, you know, Charlie, you look nervous. Are you afraid I'm going to bite? Perfect line. Delivered perfectly. Um, And Charlie then kind of asks, well, can Becky expect that kind of brutality at uh, WrestleMania? And I love that Shayna is like, Becky can expect to lose. How about you ask me what you really want to ask me? And she looks right at Charlie and talks about how she wants to destroy that her in game in this doesn't really even appear to be the title. 
Shane is not talking about the title. Hasn't been talking about the title. It's been about destroying. And I love that she answers with the fact that, yes, it is about destroying. And how making Becky lose her title will destroy her. And and I really, really got into that. I was drawn in. I was waiting for what she would say next. And then we hear the smack and see her fall over. And I wasn't expecting that. I'll just be real honest with you. I really wasn't expecting that. I was thinking, oh, oh, what happened? You know, because we see Shayna fall off her chair. And then we see Becky behind her holding a chair. Taking the chair and hitting her again before, you know, she walks off to her music. And I, I enjoyed that. I, this makes me totally getting into the Becky Shayna version of things. And I, you know, I'm a little bit of a, a, a wrestling old school. But I liked, I was one of them that liked how they did the Elimination Chamber. I liked how they portrayed Shayna. I liked how they portrayed her in NXT. And I like the turn that Becky has made of going back more intense, more focused, more like she was last year with Ronda. And how they are wanting to put on you know, a WrestleMania match. They are making this feel like it's actually WrestleMania. This is this is a storyline that I can be drawn into. Then, after commercial, we see Aleister Black. Love that they still did his entrance. Because a lot of superstars, they're not doing their entrances. But I love, they still filmed the candles. They feel, still filmed him rising up. I love how they are portraying Black. Um, This Leon Ruff that, that he was taking on, I mean, he was a little guy. I uh, He just didn't look like he even needed to be in the ring at all. Love how he looked scared. He looked nervous. Um, and how Alistair Black goes and sets in the middle of the ring. And, you know, Leon is like, make him get up to the referee. And the referee's like, no, um, this is your opportunity. The bell's already rang. You get after it. And he goes to basically Black. Black ducks and then does the pop-up maneuver that he does and hits Black Mass basically out of nowhere for the win. That's what I expect. When you're building someone up to be unreal, make them unreal. That's how the Street Profits should have handled their match. They're the tag team champions. I love that they did this with Black. They're making him be a monster. They're making him be this unbeatable force. And then they have the nerve, though, to announce that he's going to face Bobby Lashley at WrestleMania. What? Why? Is that on the pre-show? Which which day is that going to be on the pre-show? And I'm telling you, he needs to finish Bobby Lashley in two minutes. I know they've already probably taped this match because it's worthless. But Bobby Lashley better not get any offense on him. He better not spear him. He better try to go in for the spear and that's when Black hits him with the Black Mask. Because uh, him facing Bobby Lashley, again, waste of talent for WrestleMania. This isn't some job or pay-per-view that comes every month. This is the once-a-year Super Bowl, the granddaddy of them all, and all that garbage that they used to sell this. 
you could have found someone better than Bobby Lashley for Black to take on the buildup you've been giving him. It, it's just ridiculous. Then we come back from commercial and we see Kevin Owens in the ring. And he says, you know, he's heard that Seth is there tonight. And that he basically called Seth out last week and he hasn't heard from him. And so what Kevin Owens does is basically call him out again. So Seth's music hits and he comes out alone, which is shocking. I I did expect, you know, a AOP or Buddy Murphy or, or something with him. I almost even looked for maybe a run-in by Buddy Murphy. After seeing this, um, I'm excited that they didn't do that. That they refrained from doing that. I'm glad that whoever ran Raw, whether it was Vince McMahon, whether it was Paul Heyman, whether it was Kevin Dunn, I don't care who it was. Somebody basically said, Seth, go out there and be Seth. Go out there, be the architect. Go out, be who you were when you were with the authority. Go be your cocky self. Um, Seth has taken on this character of being the Monday Night Messiah. And this promo of him coming out and talking to Kevin was one of the best promos that I've seen Seth Rollins cut in a while. And I mean a long while. It was just him talking to Kevin. It wasn't him talking to the camera. It wasn't him, you know, trying to pretend like there was an audience there or anything like that. It was literally him walking around talking to Kevin Owens. And it was masterful. He talked about how when he came to WWE... They discounted everything he'd ever did before he got to WWE. And that's true. They did not care that he was Tyler Black in NAW, or in in, in TNA, sorry. I don't know what I'm thinking. But they did not count that. He started working in a warehouse that they hadn't even built a performance center. And how he had to work his way through it. And because he came before Kevin Owens and did the work and showed it up that it allowed Kevin Owens to get his chance at the Performance Center in NXT. That no one would have gotten an opportunity without Seth Rollins. That Seth Rollins allowed them to build the Performance Center. Allowed and created NXT. And allowed NXT to become what it is. And then he switched it. And he was walking up the ramp. And Seth looks at KO and says, I don't understand why you have chosen this battle to fight me at WrestleMania. And then he points out how Kevin Owens has been nothing but a failure at WrestleMania. And how he, Seth Rollins, has won championships at WrestleMania, all the accomplishments he's had at WrestleMania, but that Kevin Owens hasn't did any of that. He doesn't have a WrestleMania moment. And then, to stick the knife in and twist it, he says how Kevin Owens wasn't even good enough to be at WrestleMania last year. And he gets this look on his face and Seth says, 
Kevin, you can't beat me on my worst day. And WrestleMania is never my worst day. And that promo is what I have been wanting out of Seth Rollins for over a year. He's back to where he needs to be. I feel like the whole um, last summer storyline of of him and Becky and being a couple and, and all of that and acknowledging that on TV, it almost threw him off his stride. But he's back now. And if you did not get to see this on Raw, you need to go to YouTube and watch it. Because you will be amazed. Then they show the replay of the 2018 WrestleMania match of Charlotte Flair versus Asuka. And to me, this seems like it comes out of nowhere. We've just had this unbelievable moment with Seth Rollins, and there's no transition. They don't, they don't transition very well. Watching a little bit of that match, though, the observations that I have is Asuka looked in better shape. She looked more muscular. Her movements were more fluid in that match. However, I don't think that she was comfortable in her character compared to now. Being the green mist, evil, uh, laughing, Japanese shouting Asuka. And if somehow we could take the athletic, more muscular, uh, better shape Asuka of 2018 and mesh it with the Asuka character of today we would have a powerhouse on our team. You know, as far as I would I would want to watch that Asuka. Um, I think the thing that shocked me the most, though, about looking at that match, though, was h- how much more athletic Charlotte was and how she had a better moveset. She was smoother. Her transitions... Uh, in moves were smoother. She just seemed, I don't know, completely different. And no, don't go there as far as surgeries that she has or has not had. That's not what I'm talking about. It seemed like in 2018's WrestleMania match, that match was more put together she knew where she was going with each move. She had it thought out. It looked natural. Um, she doesn't look that way the last, I don't know, three to six months. Charlotte, I've been talking about that in, in numerous episodes. Charlotte, to me, looks distracted. She looks like she is depressed. She looks like she's not focused on wrestling. Um... She doesn't have the athleticism. Um, She is relying on the same two or three moves. She's not, she doesn't have a well-rounded different moveset that she can do depending on who she's against. And it just, it really brought it home to me to see her two years ago and then picturing what she is now. And then they lead into an interview with Charlotte, and Charlotte talks about how she enjoyed watching that because she had beat Asuka's streak of 914 straight days being unbeaten. And I did not realize that it was that long of a streak. I I don't guess I remember that part, that it being 914 days. Because... Man, oh man, that's a long time. That's almost three years when you think about it. And then Charlotte says that she is basically the master class of WrestleMania. And 
she talks about how Rhea Ripley needs to realize that and that she needs to realize that she stopped Oscar's streak, but that she also retired the Divas belt and that she became the first women's champion and that she was one of the three women that was the first ever to main event WrestleMania. And then she gives advice to Rhea Ripley that she needs to go watch all of Charlotte's um, legacy matches. I'm not excited. Um, Charlotte, you didn't do it for me with this promo. You know, when Rhea Ripley gets in the ring like she did, what, two or three weeks ago, and has a match as you come out on the stage, she never breaks eye contact with you. She does these powerful moves and pins this jobber in, uh, I think it was Sarah Logan, in basically two minutes in front of you, staring at you. Rhea Ripley makes me want to watch WrestleMania. Charlotte accounting all of her WrestleMania accomplishments and telling Rhea Ripley to go watch her matches, yeah, that that doesn't sell me on it. Um, and I don't know whether it's where Rhea Ripley is young and hungry. I mean, she's, what, 23 years old, 24 years old? Um, and she has something to prove. But Charlotte for the last three or six, three to six months, as really feels like to me that she has just become comfortable. Luckily, though, to end the show, we get unbelievable Randy Orton. This is the Randy Orton I love. I love his music. I think that he is absolutely wonderful when he has a fire lit in him. And Edge coming back has lit that fire in him. And he starts off talking about how everything he's said and done has been misunderstood. That he meant it as an act of love and people have taken it as betrayal and he's basically just misunderstood. And then he talks about how he needs to apologize to Beth Phoenix for lying to her. And he says that, you know, he didn't mean what he said about Edge to her. What he meant to say and what he should have said was that... Adam Copeland is a junkie for his ego. Adam Copeland is a junkie for Edge. And as soon as he says that, I cut back and I'm thinking, you know, AJ Styles is using the Undertaker's real name. We've got Randy Orton using Edge's real name with Adam Copeland. What's up? Why are we doing that this year? Why why do we have two two separate performers on Raw doing the same thing. We don't need that. Um, it just kind of, I don't know, takes me out of the moment just a minute. But then he said that, yes, Edge was right, that he was handed the opportunity to come to the WWE from the beginning. But that with... In one year, he had won the Intercontinental Championship, and then less than a year later, he was the world champion. And that that wasn't given to him. That he was the youngest champion ever. That that wasn't just handed to him. And he starts talking about longevity. And grit. And his accomplishments. And looking around the locker room and not seeing very many people that he came up with working like he does. Randy Orton's still in the house show circuit. Randy Orton is still showing up to every show he's scheduled for. He came up with Brock Lesnar. 
Brock hasn't worked a full-time schedule in 10 years or longer. John Cena, he came up with him. John Cena is back every now and then, but he's mostly doing movies now. Randy Orton's exactly right. For 18 years, he has gave us the longevity and the dependability. And he talks about how Edge and him must have different definitions of grit. Because he feels like he has the grit that no one else has. And then he says that because he loved Edge and he loved his wife and he loved his daughters, that's why he hit him with the chair and sent him home to his daughters is because he loves him and that he wanted him to stay home. And in a twisted little way, when you think about Randy Orton, that makes sense. That's something exactly that the Viper would do. Is I am going to send you home to your wife and daughters one way or another. If you won't listen to me by me telling you to do it, then I am going to hurt you bad enough that you have to stay home. And he says... To Edge, you may be writing the story, but I am going to write the last chapter. And I'm going to end it. And then he says, I accept. And the show goes off showing Randy Orton unusually calm. Not making a lot of movements just kind of looking around like the viper he is. Again, we have Randy Orton coming out, cutting an awesome promo. Making me want to watch Edge Orton at WrestleMania. I'm actually excited about this match. I think these two are going to give us probably the match of the pay-per-view. Or at least I hope. Uh, Because I truly want to see Edge Orton have an awesome match where not only have they been building this up, but that we get to see the story being told in the ring. And this is actually one that that I can't wait for. I kind of wish that it wasn't a last man standing match. Um with no disqualification and all that, I do understand why they chose this match. There's no doubt in my mind that Edge probably thinks that he's got a little bit of ring rust on him, that they can cover it up by using props, or they can um, be active around the performance center or wherever they're having this match, and he can use time to rest as they're going from one place to another or whatever. So um, I totally understand why this is a last standing match. Just wish it wasn't. Um, But I am looking forward to it. But of course, this still leaves, you know, a lot of questions. We've got basically one more show of Raw. And out of the Raw lineup, I I kind of want to see AJ and Undertaker to see what the Boneyard match is, to see if they're going to do a swerve, to see if it's going to look cool, if there's going to be some tricks. I'm interested in Becky and Shayna. Because I think Becky is finally back to herself and Shane is a monster. And I want to see Randy and Edge. I'm not really into Brock Drew. I know a lot of people are, but I'm not. I feel like this is a done deal. I feel like barring 
Vince McMahon changing his mind, we're going to have Drew McIntyre as the champion. And I hate going into WrestleMania knowing things. I like going in wanting things to happen. But I feel like in this one, I kind of know what's going to happen. He's going to claim Maury. And I don't know. I want a little more mystery. So I'm not really looking forward to it. The rest of the Raw matches are garbage. And I could care less about it. But a good three and a half matches, mm, okay, I'll, I'll take it. I hate it that it's going to be split up, though, over two nights if they're only going to give me three good matches from SmackDown, too, because that's going to be six good matches over two nights. Oh, uh, what to do, what to do. But anyway, you guys need to let me know what matches you think are going to be awesome. What matches are you looking forward to? What matches to you are garbage? Hit me up on Wrestling Overtime's Facebook page or us on Twitter or write me at WrestlingOvertime at gmail.com. Uh, make sure that you guys go to Podchaser and leave us a review and that you subscribe, as always, to this podcast because we will be giving you news uh, updates, rumors, and innuendo updates for the next week and a half, and we're going to be doing our rants and raves reviews of all the wrestling shows. We also will give you our quick and easy and uh, fast and furious results shows so that you guys who just want to know who won, who lost, and uh, how it happened, we'll give you those in 10 minutes or less. But I look forward to talking to you guys, and I will see you soon.